It's a great pleasure to reopen for the afternoon session and the first uh, speaker of this session is uh, Nick Cummings from King's College in London. Uh, Nick has an impressive uh, track record. I see uh, we lost this presentation. Has an impressive track record mm -hmm. in uh, terms of automatic analysis, in particular of speech for the detection for the analysis of uh, uh, depression. And his, uh, his uh, talk is going to revolve uh, around exactly this topic today. So speech analysis for mental health, opportunities and challenges. And Nick, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks, Alessandro. Thanks, Brandy. Just checking everyone can hear me OK? Sure, everything fine. Perfect. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. It's uh, the morning with some really fascinating talks that I can hope I can live up to the standard that was set. So just a little brief introduction to myself. I'm a lecturer for AI and speech analysis for healthcare at King's College London. And my research interests really revolve around this speech analysis for healthcare and also affective and behavioral computing. So really trying to understand human behavior a lot more using machine learning, using sort of signal processing. I work on the Radar CNS project, which will appear a couple of times in the talk, and I'll introduce that in a couple more slides, as well as being an external advisor on the diagnosis of depression by speech signals at a National Science Foundation of China funded project. Uh, previously, I have been a habilitation candidate in the University of Augsburg in Germany, a postdoc is the chair of complex intelligence systems again in Germany and I did my bachelor's and my PhD at the University of New South Wales in Sydney Australia which is where I'm from but on to more current work and as I said I work in the Red Ass CNS program and this is a, in, a international program exploring how wearable devices can measure depression, multiple sclerosis and epilepsy. It's an IMI funded project, which means we've got funding from both academia and also funding through pharmaceutical and tech companies. So it's bringing together a lot of different viewpoints in terms of clinical research, engineering, computer science, as well as sort of, you know, data analytics, healthcare and views, as I said, from multiple different inputs, including patients, researchers, and sort of pharmaceutical views as well. And we collect a lot of different sort of signals in this project using sort of active and passive sensing. So active sensing where people sort of interact with their phones and either record a speech sample or complete a questionnaire or passive sensing where they just sort of wear a Fitbit and we sort of monitor their health signals using this Fitbit. But speech, as I mentioned, is one of the core components of this and that's obviously the big topic of the day and I'm just going to talk a bit about what speech is, why it's such an important mental health signal and different ways we can sort of go about managing it and that's going to come up over the next few slides but starting with what speech is, speech is essentially communication with a spoken transfer of information expressing our thoughts in our emotions. So it can be intentional communication, the sort of linguistic content. You're informing your friend about a upcoming word schedule for instance. And it can be more than words. It contains a lot of sort of nonverbal behavioral information. So sometimes this is unintentional communication. You're telling your friend about your word schedule and your friend might be able to easily interpret from your tone that you dislike this schedule or it doesn't suit you. And there's this sort of unintentional communication, the nonverbal information that we're gonna focus on in this talk today. And as I find this the really most fascinating thing about speech. And speech production is just really cool when we sort of break it down and think about it. It is actually the most complex thing we do as humans in terms of muscle movement. We're, got to coordinate movement of our respiratory muscles, our lingual muscles, our articulatory muscles. So basically everything in our throat, our sort of lower jaw, upper jaw, nose, tongue, all moves together in a highly coordinated manner just to produce one single speech sound. We can move up to a hundred different muscles. And when we think about 
we can actually produce unique speech sounds at a rate of maybe 20 to 30 sounds per second. This is also not only the most complex activity, muscular activity we do as humans, but it's also the fastest discrete activity we do. So it's such a fascinating signal and it contains a lot of mental health information. And it contains this because it's highly sensitive. We're using all these muscles in a very, very controlled manner when just slight difference in these muscles can change a lot of different aspects in our speech. And we'll break this down and we'll talk about this over the sort of next few slides. So we know that very slight changes in our physical and our mental health affect the ability to control our vocal apparatus. And somehow the speech differs from its corresponding normal state. And it's this difference that I'm really interested in analyzing in my research. These differences can come up from a lot of different ways. Affective disorders such as depression and anxiety change how we speak. Developmental disorders such as autism spectrum conditions change how we speak. Degenerative orders, disorders such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, these all change how we speak. Of course, these are long-term sort of health things, but we can also have sort of shorter term health. Our emotion changes how we speak. So we know this when we're happier, when we're sad, when we're angry, when we're fearful, we can hear these when other people speak. So we can definitely measure these in speech signals. We can also have temporary states such as fatigue or intoxication, definitely changing how we speak. And of course, it's not only the sort of affective, emotional, developmental, degenerative things, our general health condition affects our voice. And we know this, and there's been a lot of things recently in and around COVID-19 affecting speech and affecting coughs that's getting a lot of sort of attention in the media and the literature. And there definitely are effects when we start to think about things that affect our lungs, things that might affect swelling in our throat that are going to change the way we speak and the way we cough, which makes sort of speech and just, I guess, auditory information coming out of the body such a really interesting signal. And it's this idea that speech contains cognitive and the muscular actions that were spoken about that means it's this really highly sensitive signal. So we've got a big sort of cognitive side in deciding that we want to speak. I want to tell you guys about how awesome I think speech is. So I've got a message I want to say. We need to form the sort of sequence of phonetic sequences of different words that go into making a message. We want to think about the tone that we say this with. And then after we've done all of this almost intuitively, we're still generating neuromuscular commands and we're doing all these sort of vocal actions. And we're going to break down each of these components a little bit over the next few slides. So we're just zooming in, zooming in. So we do our respiratory actions. We have actions in our vocal folds. We move our vocal tract. We change the shape. We vocalize some form of speech. At the same time, we're monitoring all of this. We're listening to ourselves and we're using proprioceptive feedback, to, you know, control the generate the neuromuscular commands and understand that where we're moving all our muscles within this at the same time we're thinking of the next thing to say we're doing all of this and it's a sort of almost unconscious effort and thought that goes into speaking but it's this complexity and we understand this from the years it takes us to even learn to speak properly as i said that make it such an interesting health signal but sort of breaking down and just going into some of these individual steps a little bit more of course, the key to speaking is language. We need to transfer this information, our thoughts and our emotions, and we need to make it in a way that's understood. And this is essentially what a language is. It's a set of symbols, sounds or letters and knowledge in how we can meaningfully combine these symbols to create an understandable message. And speech is made up from tiny little sounds called phonemes and phonemes are essentially the smallest sound in a language that change the meaning of a spoken word. So we think about the words B, T and T. They all have the sort of E sound at the end of them. And that's an example of one phoneme. But the thing that changes them, B, K, T, they all differ in the way they're produced. They differ in changing the words. So these are real sort of core examples in this very simple explanation here of what a phoneme is. So we build up sort of languages from phonemes, individual sounds, 
these sounds cause differences in the words. And then we've got a map into a language code. So language consists of three aspects, content, form, and use. So content is the part of language relating to meaning and vocabulary. Form is conventions for organizing word structure and word order. And use is choosing different combination of words or sentences for a given um, context. And yeah, all these things sort of interact within language. So we have a message we wanna say, there's different ways we should say that in, and there's different sort of ways we might say that. Am I saying a message to someone in a work situation? Am I talking to an old friend back in Australia? I might change how I say things, what I say based on these, this idea of form, content and use. But as I said, it's not language that I'm necessarily interested in. It's the sort of non-verbal side of things that goes along with speech, understanding basically it's not really what is being said, but how it's being said. And this information of how it's being said. I mean, what linguistically, of course, contains health and mental health information, but also this how really does. And the first stage of this is prosodic information. So what this is, is differences in the sort of rhythm, stress, intonation of speech. If we change prodigy of how we're speaking, we can indicate an attitude to what is being said. So there's a big difference in saying something authentically and saying something sarcastically. We change our prodigy and the whole sentence structure sort of changes with this. And of course, prodigy overlaps a lot with emotion in speech content and is a big marker of a lot of different affective disorders. So we have things such as intensity or loudness, vocal pitch, rhythm, speaking rate, which are all highly affected by emotion within the voice. And I mean, these are just very general rules, not necessarily specific, but things like when we're angry, we might talk faster at a higher pitch and have a wider pitch range and of course speak louder when we're angry. Sad, at the other hand, we might be speaking slower, a lower pitch, narrower pitch range and a lower volume. So these sort of differences just in basic prosodic information allow us at least to get an understanding of sort of core emotional states and how speech differs between them. But as I said, these are very sort of generalized higher level rules. So this is just a sort of background into the cognitive side of speech processing, this intent to speak, forming into a language code and forming the prosodic information. And once we've got all of this, we then generate our neuro neuromuscular commands and start all the motor actions with speech. And speech starts through respiration, the process of moving air in and out of our lungs. And the lung volume and these muscles, they're really the force behind speech. They give us the power to be able to speak. During respiration, we have to provide stable air from our lungs to actually keep providing air pressure and produce something that's understandable. And the amount of air we breathe in determines the length and intensity of what we want to say. So if we want to shout or if we want to read an extended passage, we need to take more air into our lungs, have a greater portion of volume in there, and we have to control and slowly release it in such a way that enables us to keep talking in an understandable fashion as we go along. But of course, breathing is breathing. It's not speech. There's a whole sort of set of processes now that have to go on from changing respiration into something understandable. So the first stage of this is what's known as phonation. So we're starting to convert respiratory energy into sound energy. And the first step is the function of the larynx or the vocal folds in this. And we use these in one of sort of two ways. So we have what's known as voice speech. And voice speech is when we vibrate our vocal folds at a particular frequency and produce things, sounds that have some sort of fundamental, some harmonic structure to them. So you think vowel sounds, A, E, I, O, U. These sounds all have a very nice harmonic structure to them. And this is given through the action of the vocal folds. Then we have unvoiced speech sounds where we're not actually using our vocal folds to put a sort of harmonic structure here we generate a speech sound by constricting our vocal tract and releasing energy very, very quickly. This is often done through actions of the teeth, 
or the tongue or both together. So things like F, S, T are all very good examples of this idea of putting a constriction very high up in our vocal tract, building sort of air pressure behind it and quickly releasing the air pressure. This is known as unvoiced speech. And of course, phonation relates a lot, especially in voice speech, to prosodic information. Speech is produced through exhalation of the lungs. The greater air pressure gives us greater amplitude. And at the same time, how we vibrate this causes different tensions, different rates of vibration, and changes the perceived pitch that we can get. I'll just see if this is going to play. So yeah, as we sort of breathe in, if we want to do louder, we have to breathe more air in. If we want to change the pitch, we have to change the rate of our vocal folds. And that's what's happening, right and vibration of our vocal folds. This is the idea of phonation. And this, of course, comes into prodesty. And this brings us to probably our first feature that I want to talk about, our first parameter in speech, which actually does contain a lot of mental health information. And this is the, what's known as the fundamental frequency. And this is the rate of vocal fold vibration. And this is actually a really difficult thing. Speech is quasi periodic, it's non stationary, essentially, it changes very, very quickly. There's a large variety of possible speech sounds. We have a lot of variation in vocal, in human voices. And we sort of want to undo all of this and just sort of monitor what's happening as the actual. Um, vocal folds and their rate of sort of vibration and capture this information because we know in sort of mental health disorders we see that this fundamental frequency reduces a lot in the range a uh, typical uh, sort of cliched sounding depressed voice is something that's sort of flat and monotonous so extracting this pitch information is really important we also know in a lot of different health disorders the sort of action of the actual vocal folds plays an important part of information. We can have a lot of tension in the throat caused by changes in sort of mental state if we're at higher sort of mental state or cognitive loads. This can cause muscular tension. This muscular tension changes this vibration of the vocal folds and we can capture these using sort of different measures for this irregular phonation known as jitter, which are deviations in pitch, shimmer, which are deviations in energy and then harmonic to noise ratio. So basically if the vocal folds don't shut fully, air leaks through them and this changes this idea of harmonic to noise ratio. And there's a lot of different sort of signal processing techniques we use to get out these information. But these alone, jitter, shimmer, harmonic to noise ratio, pitch, do contain a lot of mental health and health information through them. Of course, the next stage, is to go from phonation and into now mapping into these individual phonemes, into these individual sounds in the language code. And this is done through articulation, the shaping of our actual vocal track. So the process of forming speech sounds by moving our articulatory muscles. So this is basically every muscle thing, you know, put something above our nose, just above our nose and to the bottom of our throat and all those muscles, except really the ones around the back in between we are moving these and we're shaping our vocal tract and every time we want to produce a unique speech sound we have to hold our vocal tract in a particular position and we hold it in that position we produce that speech sound and then we have to quickly change that position so holding our vocal tract allows us to produce different speech sounds and this is what happening is we're filtering the acoustic energy from phonation so we're getting energy out of our vocal folds and then by squeezing and relaxing the vocal tract at certain positions, we produce different speech sounds and these then correspond to something in the sort of language code. So just play this little video here. And it's just basically showing that, yeah, as we change the position change where the constrictions happen and the relaxations happen in our vocal tract, we produce different speech sounds. And as I said, we do this 
in a sort of controlled manner to allow us to actually um, produce sounds in a particular language code relating to a particular message that we want to go and get uh, that we want to get across to someone. And of course, I've already sort of spoken about things like muscle tension, muscle control, altering when we go into a sort of higher mental state or higher sort of cognitive state or even change in our health state affecting this. So analyzing sort of features related to this shape of the vocal tract is another sort of powerful way we can get sort of mental health information. Of course, this comes from what's known as the Fourier transform, which uh, in terms of signal processing is arguably one of the most important sort of mathematical things where we're taking a signal and analyzing it and going, what's, what's our energy at sort of low frequencies and dividing up into little sort of bins and going as the energy slightly, as we go up a frequency, what's the energy, what's the energy, what's the energy, what's the energy? What's the energy? And the shape and the distribution of these energies relates to the different speech sounds that we want to hear and deviations in this away from the typical positions give us some sort of indication of sort of mental health information. There's a few ways we can do this. The Fourier transform is a very high dimensional. There's a lot of information in it. Not all of it relates to what we need in terms of analyzing speech. So we might look at something like the spectral gradient. So we're looking essentially at distributions of sort of high, between high and low energy. And what sort of happens, as I mentioned, changes in sort of health state might affect our vocal folds. If air is leaking from our vocal folds, this shifts the energy balance in the spectrum from lower to higher. So there's less low energy and more high energy comparatively to if we're in a healthier sort of state. This is one of the effects we might see. So we can capture this through the gradient or what's known as spectral roll-off points, looking at frequencies below where 50% of the energy is, where 90% of the energy is, and looking at how these shift about. At a measure like entropy, how much noise like the signal is can also contain it. So how much information is contained in the spectral signal, if this increases, there's a chance of this sort of higher energies or unwanted higher frequency energies in there. And it's what we're trying to pull out and assess and get all of this out through signal processing. And of course, if you read sort of into any speech literature, one of the features you'll come across a lot, and especially now where deep learning is prevalent a lot in speech processing literature, is the mel frequency capstrel coefficients. And this is a way that we sort of pr um, parameterize a speech signal, so extract information from it, that matches very closely to actually how we hear as humans. So we first take a look at the frequency, we do the Fourier transform, and we try to sort of separate it out a little bit more through a logarithmic transform. But the sort of key is this step where we were reducing the frequency bands. So we hear and perceive sound where we have better sort of resolution at lower frequencies and the resolution sort of gets a little bit worse at higher frequencies. So we have a lot of small little filters at lower frequencies and larger filters in a sort of triangular shape. And we're really trying to convert frequency information into this melt spectrum through this adaption, through this filtering, which is based on human hearing. And it's these mel band spectrums that get used a lot in terms of deep learning, in terms of a lot of the automatic speech recognition systems now, things like Alexa will be based on something very similar to mel bands or MFCCs, which is just a further sort of parameterization on top to try to reduce the amount of information within this sort of signal and really retain the core information relating to different speech sounds and essentially, as I said, how we extract these. But yeah, mel frequency capture coefficients and just present this as it's probably the best known speech feature and arguably when you go outside of health, one of the most widely used speech features. So yeah, that was just this sort of quick introduction to speech production, 
with a little bit of insight in how, how to extract different pieces of information from different areas of this that might relate to sort of mental health information. But before we move on, I just wanna play one little quick video, which isn't of someone speaking. It's essentially of someone doing beatboxing in a MRI machine. And it's just really fascinating to watch as it just gives you the idea of complexity in speech production or complexity, at least in movement that we have in doing something sort of producing sound like it's just a little fascinating recording that I'll just leave on for a second. Anyway, yeah, just I hope what you guys could see in that is this idea of muscles that were moving, obviously something related to speech, but just a cool, very simple example of just remembering how complex speech production is. And it's this complexity that make it a really good marker of health and of mental health. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about speech product, uh, speech parameterization, so feature extraction, before I move on to sort of talking about a few more experimental results. And if you guys are interested in ever doing any sort of speech uh, processing, the first thing we have to remember when we're doing speech processing is that it's a really time variant signal. So the words we're saying, the phonemes we're saying change really sort of regularly. And if we try to analyze speech information or over too long a time window, we first break a whole load of sort of mathematical assumptions, but secondly, we're not gonna extract any meaningful information. So all the features that I've spoken about so far, we actually extract these at a what's known as a low level information. And essentially all we're zo doing is zooming in and zooming in and zooming in on a speech signal until essentially we get a very small frame, maybe something around 10 to 40 milliseconds in duration. This is a process known as windowing. And when we zoom right into this signal, we consider it to be stationary. This is important as a mathematical concept, but it allows us to extract meaningful information without this sort of time varying nature. So we just take and extract like the pitch information, jitter, shimmer information, spectral information, MSCCs on these very, very small time windows. And we sort of overlap these time windows, this thing known as windowing, maybe something 25 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, and we shift these. So we, we go first 25 milliseconds, we extract a whole load of information. Second 25 milliseconds, we like to shift it along. So there's a bit of overlap, extract another feature vector, another same set of information we do this over the course of an utterance or a sentence that we have or a chunk of speech. The next thing we try to do is then capture dynamic information. So we're not just interested in a static one-off sort of snapshot of what might be happening, but we're interested in tracking how temporal evolutions of this. This is very simple by just looking at change in these features. So change between successive feature values or sort of a regression coefficient over multiple different feature values. We do this in both first order and second order differentials to really extract a lot of time information. So time evolution and essentially time evolution of time evolution. Then we've got all of this low level information and a lot we do in health when we wanna now extract this in terms of looking at what information might be embedded in terms of health. This is sort of lower level information is probably more informative of the linguistic content. That's what's shifting at this sort of time, very short time values. So we wanna sum up distributions of features over a chunk of speech. So maybe something like five seconds, 20 seconds, 40 seconds. We wanna obtain a fixed length sort of feature representation of this. And we essentially do this by taking summaries of these windows. 
So we have the windows, they're very, very small time instances. And then we essentially look across these and take different summaries. So we might look at things like mean, moments, extremists, percentile, slope, again, regression lines. There's a lot of different ways we can get this statistical information out. And then we essentially convert the, del the features and the delta and delta information into this sort of richer representation. So we have these short-term features, we have our delta delta information, and then we sum up all of these using these different statistical functionals over the course of a chunk of speech. And this gives us sort of very, very large feature spaces containing a lot of rich information. And we might need to do tricks like feature extraction, uh, feature selection to sort of go forward and learn specifically what we want within it. So, but yeah, this idea of brute forcing low level functionals, uh, sorry, low level descriptors followed by statistical functionals. Um, there's a lot of open source toolkits available there to use this within, um, to get yourself started if you are interested in doing any speech work in your current research. Open Smile is probably the standard coming out of Ordering, a company in Germany. And then there's a couple of newer ones that are based purely in Python being Surfboard and Libroza. These are probably the main ones that get used, but Open Smile would be the sort of default standard and a good place to start if you want to learn how to or start extracting information in this manner from speech signals that can be used to infer something about the health state. Of course, this information alone isn't enough. We need some way of going from the speech information to the health information. We can, of course, use sort of conventional statistics and a lot of ways of doing this that a lot in the clinical side of things. These are often limited in the success we get here in terms of very robust mapping and we're better going into more complex forms of analytics being machine learning. So speech, as I said, is highly complex and we do require this advanced analytics to robustly map between different speech states and diff different speech signals and different health states. So we typically use machine learning for this purpose. So for those of you who know a bit about machine learning, the next couple of slides might not be that interesting, but for those of you who don't, machine learning is a, essentially about discovering rules to process data. So in classical computer programming, we have data and we write rules and we process the data according to these rules and we get out some form of answer. In machine learning, we flip this paradigm around slightly. What we do is we input data and answers and we set up programs to essentially learn rules. And the output is a new set of rules that can be applied to new data and allow us to convert data into knowledge. So we wanna go from something we observe into something we want to know. So we observe data, we observe speech data, we have recordings of this, what we want to know might be a risk of relapse in depression and machine learning is essentially the set of rules that allows us to go between these. Why might we use machine learning? Well, it's time saving. It's very difficult to write rules to map where these sort of complex relationships between speech patterns and health. These patterns might not be obvious, but they could contain really essential information. So we want to find them. And we wanna find them in a way where we can get, if we get more data, we can get better at doing this. So machine learning learns, we make better and better decisions. So we do it to save time, to identify patterns that might not be obvious, that contain useful information and we try to get better. And of course, there's lots of different ways we can do this. Support vector machines, random forests are probably some of the more classical models that you'll see a lot in the sort of speech health literature. But of like any sort of data processing, data science task now, deep learning is definitely coming to the fore in terms of a way of actually processing the data that we um, have. So deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. And it's called deep because it puts an emphasis on 
learning successive layers of data transformations. So most machine learning models only have one data transformation, one algorithm in the middle that essentially goes from features to the score that you're interested in. But deep learning sort of embeds algorithms in algorithms in algorithms and allows us to start to learn relationships where no relationship essentially existed or very loose relationship existed, especially in terms when the relationship might be complex and nonlinear. We do these multiple steps of processing and through these multiple steps, we learn how to do our transformations. But this requires a lot of data to do it with, which is why it's sometimes not widely used in health scenarios where it's difficult to get high, the high, uh, large amounts of high quality data that we actually need to do this. So deep learning is, is just diving in a little bit more. It's based in neural networks. So this idea where we have a whole load of interconnected nodes and information essentially flows out of one node into another node where it gets weighted and summed and passed forward into another one. So we're doing what's known as dot product. So we're encoding similarity between the input information and the output information in each node. We put a little nonlinear transformation as we come through here to allow us to map complexities within here. And when we stack these in widths, we stack these in layers. And when we push information through and we train these networks, we hope to be able to learn, as I said, these complex relationships. One other reason why deep learning is getting popular is it does away essentially with a lot of the things we spoke about in the first part of the seminar. So conventional machine learning relies on features to reduce data complexity to make patterns more visual because we've only got this one layer of transformation. Deep learning means that we can take a raw signal and essentially feed it into a neural network and get out some sort of information. And the neural network is set to learn how to extract very specific features relevant to the task at hand. So it does away, you might not need to, if you had enough data, extract things like pitch, jitter, shimmer, mill frequency capture coefficients. We could actually just put raw data through a neural network and learn relevant mental health information. That's definitely an approach that is coming popular. This is known as feature representation learning. So we use what's known as convolutional neural networks, which are one of the more popular forms of neural networks, which essentially does is set up to do feature extraction in the early layers. It also downsamples information, reduces information, and essentially does the process that we would do manually a lot of the times in signal processing steps where we filter data and we try to reduce information. We do multiple steps of this and we can learn some pretty powerful representations. The Trill network is one of the more popular ones in speech and audio processing. At the moment, this has come from Google and you can use sort of features, information learned through the different layers, the different sort of tasks can map onto different mental health. But just sort of stepping back a little bit and sort of summarizing what we've gone through so far. So there's a lot of health and mental health information in a speech signal. And this is because speech is highly sensitive. Very slight changes in our physical and mental state can affect our, our ability to control our vocal apparatus. So somehow the speech differs from its corresponding normal state. Cognitive impairments can impair both generating the message and generating the neuromuscular commands. Affective disorders can bring about sort of things in respiratory control, vocal tract control, vocal fold control, articulatory control that impair the message. Muscular impairments through degenerative disorders can have very, well do have very sort of similar effects. There's a lot of different health information here, but the complexity of speech and complexity of the information of speech means a lot that we need to use machine learning to really learn and find these differences between speech produced at different health or at different mental health states. And does all of this work? Well, sort of is the correct answer here. Of course it does to a level, which is why there's a lot of us researching in here, but there's still lots of improvements to do. 
So we know fatigue is a really big marker containing both cognitive and physical aspects and noticeably affects um, speech. So here's a little sample, sorry there in German, of speech produced in a not fatigue state. And speech produced at a fatigue state. What's happening in there is the the protestee has flattened. The vocal fold action is a little bit more noise in the higher frequencies, and the intelligibility is slightly reduced. These are common effects we see in fatigued speech. Uh, it's um, looking at correlations of sort of ten point scales we can get reasonable correlation between speech and fatigue. Of course, a lot of this is in induced fatigue. So people staying awake for longer periods of time and trying to assess their fatigue at different time points. Um, some in research I'm interested in doing in the future is looking at some things like chronic fatigue conditions and how they affect speech production. Of course, a classic example of a sort of health condition or a temporary change of health state, I guess, affecting speech is intoxication. And we're all probably familiar with something like slurred speech. It's this real hallmark effect of intoxicated speech. So we know that automatic speech recognition performances drop in speech affected by alcohol. And this is strong evidence that the phonetic structure of speech is affected. And this is due to a lack of articulatory control and sort of using conventional um, speech softwares in terms of using something like a support vector machine and some of the features that we've spoken about, we can get sort of 65%, 66% accuracy between intoxicated and not intoxicated. When we move to sort of deep learning style approaches, state of the art, we're looking at something like 70% accuracy within these systems. But again, these are all on small databases. They all point to the potential of speech as a good marker in these conditions. Um, I did some research a couple of years ago into how emotion changes in children with uh, autism spectrum condition might affect their sort of speech in terms of producing different emotional states. So we had a um, data set of 25 children interacting with a humanoid robot. We had labeled them with arousal and valence information. And we were looking to see if we could use speech and body posture information to allow us to recognize the emotional state of children as they were undergoing therapy sessions with these robots. What we found was this was a really difficult task to do. We only got roughly chance level results. And this is because of the high variability of behaviors in this target population. There's no typical patterns of speech or how they use speech or emotional states in, in associated with ASC. So a lot of children behaving very, very differently meant that our system pretty much interpreted the variability between different children as noise. We weren't able to learn anything meaningful from it. We didn't have enough data to sort of learn on a per child level, which might have been a better way of build models of each individual child and the way they express emotions, which would be a way to revisit this work if I ever went back to it. But yeah, it was a very, very difficult task. We know that speech is a very good marker in something in terms of looking at developmental disorders as an aid for diagnosing those. So speech produced children with autism at a particular age versus a typically developing child we might have some differences that can be picked up using a lot of the processes that we've spoken about. Of course, affective and mood disorders, this is where the majority of my research has been done, uh, have a big effect on speech. So major depressive disorders have this persistent feeling of sadness, negativity, difficulties coping with everyday responsibilities, and they have these cognitive impairments disrupting muscle message planning and the articulatory functions. Neuromuscular commands and muscle impairment disrupt the muscular control systems. So speech really does sound a bit different between sort of moderate and severe levels of depression. the severe.
Mm -hmm. Hopefully what you could hear in that was a real difference in actually the quality of how that voice sounded. So it very much had a breathier sort of tenser sound to it. So this person had a lot of muscular impairments associated with their higher sort of mental state. When we plot the sort of frequency distributions of speech, we can really see this in the strong exemplar scenarios. So you could see at the top figure here on the right, this has produced speech not affected by depression. It has this nice harmonic structure to it. And when we look at the lower one, which is the same person doing the same task, so counting one to 10, this at a higher level of depression, this nice harmonic structure is not as clear. It's a little bit evident there, but we see it's a lot flatter. It's this more monotonous, lifeless style, diminished policy that we hear in depressed speech. And we can also see that the energy distribution is not quite as clean on this. So there are a lot of different markers. So reduced range and variability in pitch, reduced speaking intensity, reduced intonation, lack of linguistic stress, speaking rate decreases, increased pause time, and a lot of different articulatory errors come through here. So we can, on, when we're looking at sort of a depression scale between zero and 60, get relatively good accuracies of a root mean squared error of, of eight. So we're getting the depression score wrong by a factor, by a factor of eight, but the whole thing's measured over 60. So we're actually not that bad <laughs> in terms of it. And we can reduce this down with sort of state-of-the-art deep learning approaches through here. Yeah. So just sort of wrapping up, as I sort of mentioned, I'm doing work on the Radar CMS project. This is a sort of ongoing research and we've collected over 10,000 speech recordings taken over an 18 month period, both of read and free speech samples. So looking at the excerpts, as you can see on this slide of the North Wind and the Sun poem and instructing participants to also record something of, tell us something you're looking forward to in the next week. The studies had over 600 participants from three studies, so British, Spanish, Dutch. We have clinical scores for depression and anxiety, and we started investigating how some of these parameters that we spoke about in the first part of the seminar change at different levels of depression. So prosodic parameters, spectral shape, spectral balance, all sort of change with increasing depression across these different language groups. What we did find was very, was that while we saw this wholesale sort of changes, I guess, being very, very similar, when we looked at different individual features that encode this information, there was a lot of differences between the different cultures. And we need to start now exploring the effects of language in depression analysis. And this is one of the first times that this has been done and sort of really exciting to do this. And these are also real world recordings. We need to understand how noise affects these recordings and how people's ability to sort of follow instructions and things like this also affect the recordings. And to this end, we've been doing a survey through our study in terms of trying to isolate different facilitators and barriers. So understand acceptability, acceptability issues surrounding actually recording speech remotely as part of a study. We've just had a paper accepted to this uh, into speech and there's a preprint available. Some of the really interesting observations that we saw in this study were that our study participants actually reported or thought they completed the speech recording task more than they did. And this is what you can see in this figure where on the y-axis we have actual completion versus self-reported completion on a scale of zero to five by cut scale. So zero being never, four being all the time. And you can see that a lot of people thought they did it all the time, or at least some of the time when in actual fact, they did it sort of less than 60 or even less than 50% of the time. So one of the things, the same um, survey that we were asking was obstacles that might've prevented people completing their scheduled recording tasks we found that missed notifications, low mood and forgetfulness were really sort of important issues in terms of actually collecting the speech. 
participants were also sort of almost a little bit as expected, more comfortable completing the red speech task than the free speech task. And we did notice a difference in the completion rates between these. So it's a really interesting finding and we're sort of, the uh, initial finding was, was done from Britain and Spain. We're also looking now at data from the Netherlands and then expanding it into some of the else, other health conditions that are in RAD RCNS. So it's gonna be some interesting results coming out of there. So yeah, a little bit more back to here, speech analysis and mental health, does it work? There's a lot of really promising signs that we can get some really useful health information, especially related to things such as depression. I didn't speak as much about Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, childhood developmental disorders. We can get some useful information when we start to combine speech with other sort of wearable information, behavioral information. We can really start to use it to create rich health information about people at different stages of their life, early warning systems, more preventative personal healthcare sort of scenarios, speech should definitely be considered one of the core signals that goes into that. But of course, there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of trying to wrap this up. Um, I sort of said here, sort of technical challenges, speech alone is not enough. How do we combine it with other data and knowing that when we're looking a lot of computational data, the reliability of this information can change over time, not necessarily even due to health information, just, you know, if we're using a wearable to, to extract heart rate information, if the batteries start to go flat, that information might not be as good. Of course, with real world data, data goes missing. Is this an error or is this informative? Is someone not giving us speech samples anymore in a study? because their mental health state has changed and they no longer want to give us them? Or is it because their phone is broken? How do we handle different sparsity? How do we realize this? And of course, anything with AI, trust and explainability are big issues. There's a lot of sources of bias in data that need to be addressed, uh, need to be understood and minimize their effects into sort of future models. And anything we're using AI in and using deep learning in, we need to get a better understanding of how decisions are made. There's a lot of examples. We can't presume that AI makes a decision in the same way we would make a decision as human. We need to understand these mappings a bit better in detail. And especially in terms when we start to push things more into proper clinical studies, people have a right to know as well how decisions about them got reached. We need to understand that. Sort of more generalized challenges in this area, we always need more data, any sort of data science, data driven thing, more data, better. And as I said, the results highlight the potential of speech, but more data is needed to realize this. We need to understand the sort of motivations behind people giving us data and create technology that people want to use. We also need to do more targeted modeling. We know from speech processing that a lot of features and machine learning techniques, we use them across similar, similar health conditions, we get very similar results. And does this place an upper bound on our model accuracy? Are we better collecting more data and going in more sort of self-learning, deep learning style approaches to try to extract the exact information we read rather than use more generalized information and try to learn from that. And also more sophisticated modeling as you can see, a lot of the results I presented were looking at a very binarized version of health. Does someone have a conditional don't they? But health is a lot more multifaceted than this. How can we understand this sort of multifaceted nature? And again, it comes back to larger studies collecting more data, but I do think the potential is there for speech as a signal. And I'm really excited to push forward the next sort of wave and see what comes out as well from other people in this area of sort of um, speech analysis in healthcare. So that sort of ends my talk and thanks for listening. I'm just gonna be a little bit cheeky and just put up a couple of adverts before I finish. So the first is for a conference called Hiltac, which is running next week. I'll just leave that up for a moment. Um, registration is currently open. If you're a student, registration is free for that. So it's more on 
linguistic data and text data for healthcare, but there is going to be a panel on um, speech analysis and the sort of acoustic prosodic information in healthcare as well, running on the afternoon of the 17th. It's, as I said, free for students and £10 for everybody else. And I'm also running a special session at the um, ICMI conference at the International Conference on Multimodal Interactions, looking at socially informed AI for healthcare. So if you are at a stage where you do have some publishable results, please consider publishing your, um, submitting your work there. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk to you guys. And hopefully I've just left enough time for a few questions.